So I would like to start the webinar right now. Hello to everyone and all, to all the attendees joining us from around the world. Welcome to the 3D Organoms webinar. Uh, today's topic is an integrated approach to teaching clinical anatomy by combining virtual reality models and cadavers. My name is Kristina Shiposhova and I'm a sales manager and XR specialist at 3D Organon. And today I will be your host for this session. We have invited a special guest speaker and a member of 3D Organon Scientific Advisory Board, uh, Dr. Alan Sterling. He's an Associate Professor of Clinical Anatomy at Bond University in Australia on the Gold Coast. Uh, hello, Alan. Good morning. Good morning. Hello there. Thank you for joining us. So uh, Alan will share his experience from his lectures at the university, and he will show us that virtual reality can be nicely implemented in the lectures and does not necessarily need to replace classical methods, but can be a nice way of uh, complementing uh, other methods to be used in uh, del delivering anatomy lectures. So we will have also a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to ask questions. Alan will be here for you to reply um, and um, to uh, address all the concerns, questions, and comments you may have. Uh, so before we start, I would like to state that none of our guest speakers and members of the 3D Organon Scientific Advisory Board receives any reward or remuneration of any kind uh, for the participation at the webinars. Uh, Alan, uh, now I will give you the space to introduce yourself and to start with the presentation whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. Excellent. I will just pop the camera on. Hopefully the audio is good for everyone. You'll let me know if there's any, any dropouts. I should be appearing yeah. just below Omo Hyde if the technology works. There we go. Yes, we can hear you well. We can see you well. Fantastic. Okay. Well, good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. I know there's different people coming from different time zones. Thank you for giving up your time to join us here and um, welcome you all. Thank you to the 3D Organon team for inviting me to speak here. As Christina said, my name is Alan. I'm Associate Professor here at Bond University, the Head for Anatomy. So it's great to have many people joining live. I know it doesn't necessarily work um, the timing for everyone. So I do know it is recorded as well. So people will be able to um, watch it later when it is uploaded. Now I've chosen quite a broad topic for today. Um, and I'm Alan, to... sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Um, we have a message that we can't see you. I can see your video on your uh, right bottom corner. Um, we see a message that you are not visible. Mm. Oh. Uh, should be on the screen share. Can it, no, it's not. Yeah, I, I myself can see you on the right bottom corner. Um, okay, now I, I have confirmation that uh, other participants they do see you. So uh, let yeah. me confirm just before we continue, so that we are sure we can see you. Perfect. All of yeah. us. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Everybody can see you now. Okay. I'm, nice. I'm, I'm hidden just just below Omohai out here. Yes. There we go. Yeah. You are there, right bottom corner. Excellent. I, I can switch saying... back to Zoom if that's if that's confusing. Not a problem. Not a problem. No, it's a, you are um, hidden among the structures of the neck. Okay. Great. That's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, nice. And so yeah, as I say, the topic is quite broad. So I, I I'm only really going to be able to scratch the surface, and I'm I'm very aware that there's probably broadly speaking, two sets of, of people in the audience today, that there are those that are educators who are looking to implement this maybe in their in their teaching, maybe from a very, very initial point of view, where they're kind of starting to take that leap into choosing a, a, a software platform and choosing some devices, or maybe you've already got some technology, but you're just needing some fresh ideas of how to um, augment it and bring it into your teaching. And then there's probably some in the audience this morning who are the students, the stakeholders, who are maybe looking for ways to maximize your learning with all these varied confusing tools that you have access to and perhaps a way of um, looking at it differently of how you can get the best out of all the, the functionality. So for each of the sort of two subgroups, hopefully there'll be some nuggets of information that you can take away today. So uh, my plan for the, for the session is really just to um, give you a bit of a, my journey to teaching anatomy and why I, I find it so um, rewarding. A little bit about my thoughts on how we currently integrate anatomy and a lot of this is probably a little bit of common sense and is borne out by the research but then there's some elements in there where I just think we're not really thinking about and um, the advantages that the 3D applications can give us over the very traditional methods of teaching. Um, some use cases for how I and my team use 3D Organon in our practicals in an integrated fashion and then at the end we'll just have a quick wrap up and some some questions and it's perhaps the questions where I can get to know you a bit more and, and your specific um, use cases. So my journey um, was quite a quite a traditional one my medical training when I um, 
trained as a doctor was back in um, 1997 in sunny old Dundee in Scotland. This turned out to be actually quite a, a hotbed of medical education. It's where the Amy Centre is. And that's where I really got interested in anatomy. I was very much um, surgically minded and that's what all my focus was to be getting into to, to surgery. I then went on to do my surgical training just slightly north of Dundee up here in Aberdeen. And I left there following my surgical exams to take a surgical job in Australia. And it was at that time that there was a medical school here in the Gold Coast called Bond University that was just starting to set up. Now it looks a beautiful building now. It didn't look like that back in 2007 when I joined, but I was fortunate enough they were looking for clinical anatomists to teach into the programme. And they were a very dynamic and sort of um, flexible, nimble organisation that allowed me the scope to kind of look to ways of enhancing the, the old fashioned traditional ways, bringing in some technology, which is what I've always been very passionate about, how we can use it in a, in a beneficial way not just because it's bells and whistles, but to actually augment and um, enhance the ways that we currently use anatomy. And so I've been there ever since. I'm now part of quite a dynamic team. We're all, um, the anatomists I work with are all very much into using technology and integrating it in their own teaching. So I don't have that fight to try and bring in new technologies or, or try anything new. Um, everyone is kind of on the same page from that point of view. So my thoughts, just as a sort of broad strokes of where we're at with anatomy is that obviously learning has changed and the learners have changed. Now, most of our um, students are undergraduates and many in the audience, irrespective of which subject you're studying in the college or TAFE or whatever your final career may be, you're probably all sitting in the sort of even born after the year 2000. So you've been born into this world of technology with all these different choices. And that's not to say that we're calling you digital natives. I don't necessarily like that name because we find that a lot of these students who are um, used to using technology from a day-to-day -day basis in their studies, when they, when they get into VR, it's very different. They're not used to that. So we can't assume everyone, first of all, knows how these systems work. And that's quite important when we look at our training and our initial implementation. Then the teaching environment has changed. Obviously, we had a little thing called a pandemic, and not to trivialise it, but it made the way we taught as educators change. It made the students learn in different ways. And much of that was beneficial. It's really pushed forward that whole distance, remote learning, multimodal, asynchronous learning. Um, the way that we can sort of send our students information has changed and access our students. And I think that's really been accelerated by that sort of last uh, sort of five years there's a real boom of just really high quality resources out there for students. It's obviously quite confusing to choose, but it means that you've got phenomenally well-produced, high quality videos, podcasts, digital resources out there. And I think that means that the, the organizations like 3D Organon can't rest on their laurels. It's been really good that it pushes these companies forward to innovate and to show their point of difference to continually add new functionality. And I think that's only going to be a benefit for us as the, the users of these platforms. And so we as educators, we have to show our point of difference. Why would a student get out of bed, travel to university, sit in a, in a anatomy practical or a lecture with a worksheet of paper or to fight for space to, to, to look at a model or a cadaver, we have to really make sure there's value in any experience that we're giving them. And so that comes down to the planning and really the point of difference is that they will not learn that experience we're providing is unique and they cannot get that in any other way. And then finally, technology. Technology has massively changed with the advent of faster graphic cards and processors. We're at the point where these consumer level headsets, which used to be out of our uh, price range, are now very much accessible. Faculties can buy them in, in numbers, can provide a suite of VR and 3D anatomy applications for their learners. And whilst, whilst dissection still remains, and we do use dissection, and I'm a big advocate for, for prosections and cadaveric dissections, um, the way that the stakeholders, the way that you as students are going to be interacting with your patients and with anatomy in your chosen careers is not the same way it used to be. There's no longer going to be really cases where you're opening up an entire abdomen like you would in a dissection room or opening up a chest that like you would traditionally for some type of cardiothoracic operations. You're now looking at it through literally a different lens. You're looking at it through keyhole techniques, laparoscopic cameras, robotic surgery, minimally invasive. Um, for those of you that are studying allied health, physios and, and the allied health practitioners are now interacting with anatomy using ultrasounds, using portable devices to cannulate or to find tendons or to provide care. So we have to think about that 
not only the students, how you're learning the anatomy, but the educators, how are we portraying this anatomy? Are we really making sure that it's exactly the way they're going to be seeing it when they're in the, in the workforce? Um, I mean, I think, so I've titled this really Start Small and Have a Plan, and this is really for the educators that are starting to think about the adoption of these um, applications. It can seem quite daunting. Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited to write a, a chap chapter in this textbook here, which really breaks it down to the pros and cons of using these virtual and mixed reality devices, how to best embed them, thinking about which um, platform is best from a, from a headset hardware point of view. I don't get any money if you download that book or if you access that book, it might just be a helpful resource for you if you're at the, the very beginning of your um, VR journey. And I think about the, the limited research that I do as well, because I'm coming from more of a medical background than a, than a research background, but it's always been in technology enhanced learning. And it's really been showing that these new technologies have really massive potential to augment the traditional. I'm not saying, and I'm not an advocate to say that we throw away the calibrate based dissection or the models or the prosections, but really if we think really smartly and carefully of how we use these devices, they bring so many positives and so many pros to our teaching suite that you just can't get with the traditional, traditional methods. So planning, well, I think it stands to reason that when you're creating a teaching session, you have to think about it way, way before the students get into the lab. The components that are part of your lab are obviously very important. So you have a short time with your learners, you're competing with all the other subjects they're studying, and so you really need to show that value added. I think the adage that comes from the military is that proper planning prevents poor performance. And so here we have this um, really before the lab is even um, idealized, we have this request form. Here we have the very traditional sort of we're wanting some pro sections, but now we have, we have digital anatomy space available to us. We have some virtual reality headsets that we actually want to set out. Have these learners actually been trained on the virtual reality? Because that's very important. You're not just throwing learners into a room and giving them a headset and, and letting them go for it. You have to teach them and train them. But it's a, it's a team approach. Um, we have to think about more than just the students and the educators. You have to think about your technical staff. They have to, we have this in this request form. We even get down to the nuts and bolts of have we got cleaning wipes? Have we got the, the chargers? Um, have we got IT support? Is the Wi Fi code the same for each device so that we can actually stream these devices and show, allow the students to share their journey and other people to watch what they're doing? It sounds very simple, but actually, you need to plan this out before you're actually even getting a student into the lab. We also send through to our technical staff a sort of schematic overview, and this is credit to my colleague, Dr. Lottery, who kind of came up with this, where if we're taking you from the right hand side of the screen here, we have a digital um, anatomy suite where we have a row of computers where we usually have our desktop organ on running, um, and then we have a space for up to well, it's actually slightly more now, but we're about five VR pods, we call them, which is spaces that are designated for the virtual reality headsets that then the students have a safe boundary and we have some devices nearby that they can share and screencast to, whether that's a large screen or a small iPad. And we embed this in almost all of our labs. We have this sort of creative suite involved. And as the students progress through the lab, they're using VR and the models. We're using pro sections. And then we're getting onto a sort of a clinical application station. And then we get to some, in most cases, we have some sort of formative assessment where the students can test themselves. What we also like to do though, is because the students are in this computer room, is that the formative assessment that's built into the 3D organ on platform is really valid as a kind of low stakes and um, testing themselves. It really spirals them through from the basics right through to much more clinical, clinically applied questions. So they can really kind of scaffold their learning and, and show their journey and how they're improving as they go based on the, the, the difficulty of the questions they're answering. And that's really how we try and embed all of our labs. We have a think initially of, of where we can best situate um, the clinical anatomy with the 3D applications and how we can then link that to our cadaveric, cadaveric and our models. And that, that starts out way before we have, as I say, the students in the lab. This is our um, area we have at the end of the lab here. We're very lucky and fortunate that this was built. It grew from a need to embed virtual and mixed reality into as many of our labs as possible. And we have the computers along the back wall running the 3D organ on desktop version. And then we have, you can just see the X on the floor there. That's one of our sort of a, a VR pods or stations where the students have a boundary and they can explore. And there's always someone there nearby as well, just to make sure that they don't sort of 
get lost or disorientated and in, in, in staying safe. And we can use the screens and the iPads to share their, their view so that the students can interact and kind of have it more of a, of a, a team based approach to it. Now I've put up a picture of the Oculus Quest. I'm fairly platform agnostic. I don't really advocate you have to go out and get any particular headset. We just have stuck to the one vendor. We find that this works quite well. The software updates can all be managed quite nicely. We don't have to do different downloads and different software platforms. We have 10 of these. We're very lucky that we have 10 um, to run a 3D organ on in VR. And we also have a couple of the uh, PC powered VR um, headsets as well. Or, systems on the PCs that we can um, take, take advantage of the other functionality that that gives you, like the ultrasound and so on. I think really if you're a soft, if you're an educator, you have to think about what your needs are, what kind of processing power do you need, think about things like battery life, software updates, your IT um, department may be particularly fond of a particular provider rather than uh, than another. So that's really at the planning stage. The key is that we, um, someone just said, yeah, the meta accounts, we, we've, we've, we've got um, that all basically logged in. Someone's asked the question, sorry, about how we handle the requirement of Facebook. We have created meta accounts with our Bond IT staff. And so we have individual um, numbered uh, headsets and they're all linked to a specific iPad on the same Wi-Fi code, which is a specific blocked um, AP node so that no one else can access that. So there's no uh, possibility of the students basically changing the password or logging out. Um, yeah, I hope that hope that answers that question. So we embed this into um, all of our practicals from week one. When we have a new group of students, we actually give them training on the, the 3D organ and the VR headsets right from, from the first practical so that they're then used to the software and they get the most out of it. From a, from a functionality point of view. And so I was going to take you through a little bit of a, um, just a case example really of what we did. This was a lab we ran just a couple of weeks ago. We were doing the female reproductive tract. And for educators, I think you kind of also need to go back to that sort of first principles is what does the final journey for your students? How will they end up interacting with patients? And how will they see the anatomy? And the way clinicians and nurses now view the female reproductive tract is, is traditionally now um, through laparoscopic surgery or minimally invasive robotic surgery. So we want our students to understand not just the anatomy, but also that view that they're going to be presented with when they're in surgery, when they're actually getting into their, their surgical rotations. This is basically showing us here on the left that for a typical laparoscopic procedure in the pelvis, you're going to have a, a keyhole um, camera through the umbilicus, but you also have these additional ports that are put in. Now, this is maybe a little bit clinical for, for some in the audience, but apologies, but really it's just a case example to show you that when you're putting in these ports at the side, there are some fairly important structures on the anterior abdominal wall you need to be aware of. And it would be a really hard dissection to, to get to if, we, if we'd wanted to just show these vessels, but with 3D Organon, we can really show what are these structures that are running in the anterior abdominal wall that you're at risk of putting your trocar through? We can show them from the internet and from and some images I've taken from the theatres that I attend that are our structures nearby. And this is really something you couldn't replicate with a cadaver, not without a lot of extra equipment and, and, and the machinery. And with a simple sort of setup with the 3D organon and the digital anatomy, we can really apply the kind of surgery they're going to be looking at, the views they're going to be looking at, and we can relate that to the, that, that viewpoint. It shows the students the importance of, of essentially the, the application of the anatomy, not just remembering all these structures. This is a laparoscopic view as well, the female pelvis, and this is a case um, prior, to, prior to a hysterectomy. Again, something you can reproduce with traditional cadavers or models, but this view on the right, I think this is just, it's, just from my background of um, teaching anatomy for so many years, I think it's just phenomenal that the power that these applications provide us that within a couple of minutes, I was able to strip out this sort of extraneous information and give an almost sort of like for like laparoscopic view as you were looking down from the umbilicus down into the pelvis. I just think that's it was mind blowing that that would take tens of hours to get a cross-section like that to get that view. And here we can have multiples of students sharing that. We can set that up as a pre-configured screen. We can show that on a large screen and we can interact with it um, with, our, with our learners to show them well, what are the structures you're going to be looking at when you're in surgery? Where are the important vessels that you need to make sure you protect? What structures are there that are, that are in, the, in the operative field? 
And so again, that's, that shows the power of you need to think of the way these students are going to be seeing anatomy, rather than just it being uh, a prosection of a pelvis, you actually can give them the viewpoint that they're looking at down the laparoscope. Following on from that, again, in the same lab, where we want to sort of correlate some more of this clinical anatomy in the female reproductive tract. It looks a little bit like arts and crafts on the left hand side here, but it really is as simple as a whiteboard and then drawing on the blood vessels for the, um, for the pelvis and then just using some string and blue tack to kind of pin the end organs. And from that, they can kind of get a representation of where these structures are. We then can move on to the 3D organon and we can obviously manipulate in 3D space and pull out the veins and the stuff that we really don't want to see necessarily to try and tie that in. Why is that important? Well, again, we can link it to the clinical anatomy. We can have a think about when we're, we're doing this operation or when you're watching this operation, there's a, there's a ureter nearby that's a damage to being, to being um, clipped or cauterized when we're, we're dealing with these vessels and stopping any bleeding. Well, where is that ureter? How can we visualize that in the pelvis? What is the damage? And then we can take it to the next level and we can talk about, well, at the end of an operation, and this happens in real life, we check that we haven't damaged these ureters. And how do we check we haven't damaged these ureters? Well, we have a look inside the bladder with a keyhole camera again. The way that we do it in, in this part of the world when I'm assisting is that we, we get a special um, dye that's injected by the anaesthetist and you can see this little puff of blue. This is the opening of the ureter coming into the bladder. Well, we can then recreate that, and I can draw this in real time with the paint tools by doing a sagittal slice through the bladder and my very bad artwork showing that this is where the blue is coming from. This is where we're basically entering the, the bladder with the ureter. And that essentially means at the end of our operation on the, on the uterus, we haven't damaged the, the ureters and the patient is, is safe to be sort of woken up and and um, has come through the operation. And that's just really scratching the surface of the functionality here for the, for the software. The, the slice functionality that there is in, the, in PC Power VR is phenomenal when you want to think about anatomical relationships and you want to talk about um, medical imaging and so on. And so you think about these healthcare providers um, you're all going to be going on to careers as nurses or physios or doctors or whatever it may be. You need to be able to visualize and think paint a picture in your mind's eye and that's really where the benefit of um, the, the 3D representation and the ability to sort of pan and slice and zoom and, and get rid of some of the information that's confusing, get rid of some of the structures that you're not necessarily needing to focus on. So it's really opening up uh, new frontiers. The next little, next little bit I just wanted to share with you a couple of very short um, videos that I took as I was teaching and um, some learners that came up after the lab and still had some questions. Um, this is really, I, I kept this screenshot at the start of the presentation to show you for those that are using the, the Oculus and the Meta version that here on the, on this kind of menu screen, the share button here is how you can then access to take photos and take recordings. And that's quite powerful if you're an educator and you're wanting to show that in your lectures, for instance, or even if you're a learner and you're wanting to sort of keep a little essentially a little anatomy diary or a little anatomy atlas of your own um, studies. You can take specific screenshots or short videos. So I'll just briefly play this. There is no narration. Apologies for the black screen. It was kind of clipped a little bit as I recorded it. But um, here I went to just a pre-configured scene. We're talking about the, the female pelvis and we're trying to link it to the anatomy of what, what would dictate whether there'd potentially be any issues in delivering a baby um, a vaginal delivery for female, if there was any previous pelvic injuries or fractures. We talk about things like the, the, the angles and the distances across the pelvis, what creates the pelvic brim, what creates the, the birth canal. Here I'm just use, using again some very bad drawing, I'm afraid, of the, um, the conjugates, these distances across the pelvis that the obstetricians, the clinical doctors need to be aware of when they're initially sort of um, seeing a patient, uh, a female who's early stages of pregnancy, trying to mitigate any future um, problems with uh, having a normal birth. And that might mean that they need to get a cesarean, for instance. Again, I'm doing some bad drawing in the air to write the word conjugate. And we can use that to talk about the different sizes and the differences between the male and female pelvises. Again, here, I'm just doing some drawing, talking about that subcubic angle. But I had about five learners all gathered around the screen at this point on the TV and I'm talking to them and they're asking questions as I go. And it's just a really powerful way of, of showing you how you can kind of link it to the, the clinical application as well.
Um, and there's not one more very short video again. This is very, very brief because I didn't want to, to bore you all with, I think it was about 10 minutes that, again, using the drawing tools here, this is a group of students who are str uh, struggling with a concept, quite a clinical concept of um, spaces and perineal pouches within the pelvis. So I've edited, edited it for brevity, but you can see again the power where we can virtually dissect something that's just not possible um, with the traditional methods where I can show the deep pouch here strip away the structures that are that are superficial and as I as I talk to the students again we can go backwards and forwards and we can we can move around and, and give them a really a viewpoint that is unique for their learning and show them the spaces and, and the structures that are nearby. Here I'm just showing that again something in dissection that's very difficult to find in the female that um, round ligament running through the inguinal canal but here you can you can see it beautifully and show them the, the sort of journey and the, where it's heading to again stripping off some of the muscles in this region and explaining the concepts of these deep and superficial pouches which have a clinical correlation when you're thinking about um, pelvic floor prolapsing or, or dysfunction or uh, bladder instability so a kind of a summary i suppose because I, I do obviously I'm aware I can only scratch the surface of this and hopefully this gives you some ideas of how you can maybe bring it into other body systems and integrate this in your own way. I think for, for educators, consider it, plan it ahead of time, test it, start small. Um, always have that in mind. We, we don't specifically have learning outcomes that have the word virtual reality in them. So our, our learning outcomes are still very much the, the analyzing, the describing, the understanding, the, the kind of linking together concepts and, and scaffolding the learners uh, but we use VR to achieve that so you don't specifically need to rewrite your whole curriculum is what I'm trying to say it augments the traditional methods most of the research that I've done and most of the research out there shows that these are great tools that can give you the, all these advantages it's asynchronous you can have really specific um, standardized viewpoints one of the, the big proponents of, of dissection is that you get access to all this anatomical variation, which is true, but sometimes you don't want all the anatomical variation. If you have 10 cadavers in a room, everyone's seeing a slightly different picture. Sometimes to give your very early learners a standardized view where they can see the normal anatomy, and then you can take it to that next level. So sometimes the pros of, of um, the cadavers and dissection can also, be a, can also be a negative or a con. Use it to its advantages. As I say, the ability to show small, complex structures. When we're doing head and neck anatomy, and we're doing some things like the, the inner ear, this is impossible to see a, a really good prosection or, or cadaver for that. And therefore, we can blow these things up. We can show multiple learners these tiny little structures um, in just so much greater fidelity than you can get with the, the traditional means. For you learners out there, for those that are, that are using this tool, either you have your own device or your institution gives you access to this, take advantage of all the functionalities, really dig in and have a play with the, the 3D Organon software to see all these new innovations that they've brought in because they're having to continually push themselves forward to, um, to innovate and to, to add in all these extra things. There's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that many of our students don't take advantage of. They're, they're using a fraction of the functionality when they discover that there's this inbuilt formative quiz and um, that's they just they love that they, they, they spend hours in our in our little room outside of the normal class time teaching themselves and quizzing themselves and as they progress through and they're into the clinical phase of the program they come back and they can they use that to link to the more clinically applied questions have a think for for you learners what your final career pathway is how does it relate to your final profession and then maybe when you're using the software look at it through that lens start by looking in in the abdomen from a sort of laparoscopic view or start if you're a physio trainee having a look using the using the ultrasound mode for pc powered vr or having a look at just the the stripped down virtual dissection of the, the, the cannulation and um, if you're thinking about that or tendons or musculopathies or whatever it might be so you really have to kind of reimagine from the old-fashioned way of learning um, so that gives you the best advantage when you're on your clinical rotations or when you're actually finished up and you're and you're out there in the, in the work force. Um, so that was really thank you all for your attention. I, I know I, I'm kind of obviously just scratched the surface, but I think what might, might be useful now is I see a couple of questions have come in. But um, if there's any other questions of any way I can try and help you or give you some um, hints and tips of the other ways we've we've enhanced it and we've augmented it in our in our teaching. And please feel free to, to, to 
shout out in the chat. Yeah, Alan, thank you very much for an extremely interesting presentation where you showed us like the real application and the real use of these technologies in the lectures. This is what educators and health professionals always want to see so that they can be inspired and, and, and to get some tips how to actually implement this in their lectures as well. So thank you for sharing your experience. That's sure. really, really, uh, really valuable for us. And as Alan said, we have this space now, 15 minutes, more or less, for questions. And you uh, use this opportunity to ask um, uh, from professionals and experts on virtual reality in anatomy. So uh, we have uh, one uh, question from um, Deepika. Thank you. Uh, so this was when you were showing the videos. Um, so she's asking um, uh, if, the, if those video presentations that you were showing, uh, are they catering which year medical students? So who are the students? students? Uh... The, the first one for the osteology of the pelvis was a first year medical student. Yes, so that was linking in. There is an undergraduate course, um, even though we have postgraduates. So people that have studied anatomy already, our medical program, which is where these were taken from, is, is an undergraduate. So these are students that essentially have not done any anatomy before. So that was built into their osteology of the pelvis and lower limb. Um, but even from, from year one, we really want to try and show them why they need to know this. It's not just memorization, it's really the application of even in a year one student, why do you need to know the bones and why do you need to know what these distances are? Because they're potentially going to be important when you're in your obstetric or your women's health block in three or four short years time um, to, uh, to, be, to be of value when you're looking at a, a pregnant woman and potential birth complications. Yeah, the second one on the... Um, pelvic floor and the, and, the, and the layers of the pelvis. That was a second year, um, uh, but early in second year uh, anatomy practical that was linked, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just also a question from me, uh, Alan. Uh, so we were, we were seeing some uh, synchronous sessions or physical, um, so the use of these uh, uh, recorded materials or sessions from physical classrooms. Uh, do you offer your students a recorded study material and how do you share that recorded study material with them? Maybe this may be interesting for the others. I have, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I have used it. I've actually used it live uh, in my lectures mm -hmm. as well and um, mm -hmm. with the PC powered version and all of the lectures are captured or video captured. So I suppose from that point of view, the students have um, access, only those students in that program have access via a special platform. Uh, they can't download it, but they can access it throughout the course of their studies for all five years. So it's kind of archived. Um, for other ones in the lab, those, those test examples there was just me recording it for, for this purpose. I did that live with the students there, but they were watching it um, obviously on a big screen. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't recorded um, during the labs. Typically the labs are, are, are all running, obviously um, concurrently students are at all different stations. And so we don't, um, we don't record the labs, but, uh, but yeah, the students have access to, to that room and to the technology so they can make their own videos and their own, uh, they have the logins as well, separate to, separate to um, the headsets, the desktop computers all have a generic login for them to use, which is linked to their bond, bond account. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. And so yeah. um, I'll just mention a few. Mm. So Shazia, thank you for joining us today. And um, so Shazia is asking uh, how to develop a module of anatomy courses based on using virtual reality. How much or how, how many percent it should be added in to this body system course? Yeah, uh, good question. I suppose, I think it, it, it probably um, relates to the year level of your learner and probably the, the body system. I, I really feel that some body systems, uh, when it's small structures that can't be really well visualized with, with traditional means or um, really kind of niche clinical very concepts that our students traditionally find difficult to understand. I think that's maybe where we have more of the, the VR content in there. I don't have a specific number in my head whenever I'm planning. We just try and make sure that almost as many, uh, all of our labs have some element built in there so that the students are used to that and are interacting with it in that way. I've even brought it in because my other side of my, my job is I'm in the hospitals working clinically in, in operating theatre still. I actually have bring bring in the headsets for interoperative kind of like 
not planning, but uh, discussions with our students when they're doing surgical blocks where I can actually show them, uh, I'm doing spinal surgery, I'm assisting with, I can show them basically what the operation is they're just about to, view, to watch. And it means that they're much more engaged in the operation and they have more of an idea of what's going on. If they've had a bit of a heads up beforehand of what the anatomy is, they're likely to see um, how to relate that to the, the, the scans and the navigation we're using, where the placement of, for instance, things like screws and rods, if we're doing stuff, um, uh, spinal fusions and so I've actually even brought it into the real world into the operating theatre and, and had the students look with the headsets prior to actually then watching the operation so I think probably I don't know if I've necessarily answered the issues yet I think it's probably demands very much on the body system some lend themselves way more to um to to, to having more percentage of the the VR and the um the 3D application of the, the digital technology uh, and some perhaps are maybe more seen. We still do dissection. And so in our dissection classes, uh, we have specific um, viewpoints that we have pre-configured for the students to kind of dip in and see, but we really want them to spend the majority of their time dissecting because there's still a lot to be gained over and above the anatomy in a dissection session with the, the tactile, the sort of the psychomotor, the, the learning to use these instruments. So again, that's, I'm, I'm never trying to replace traditional methods. I'm really just wanting to augment what we've got so that the students in that really small snapshot of time that they're in the lab get the most, the most out of the experience. Mm. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we have a Joanna. Uh, Joanna, thank you for joining us as well. Um, and Joanna asking, um, do your students use uh, VR individually or are they ever in a virtual room together, either with an instructor or in study groups? Uh, they, when they're with us in the labs, they're using it individually, but casting it to, to a, a bigger screen so that there can be small groups of them working through. Typically when we try and embed it into labs, we have specific structures that we want them to see in their workbook mm -hmm. and they bring that in either digitally or sometimes as paper-based. And so they, they can have some sort of like a, a scribe almost mentioning the structures that they're, they're all supposed to see and they can work through that worksheet. Um, no, I'm probably a little bit um, behind in, in the, the implementation of using it in a virtual environment. I know there is that functionality. We did a little bit of that during COVID where everything went remote and we were, we were running things really up with me and the anatomy laboratory and the students all around the country. Uh, but no, we're, we're running it basically directly students using an individual headset but um, streaming that or casting that to a, to a separate device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Oscar from Colombia uh, is, um, uh, is uh, thanking for the, for the presentation and has a few questions regarding this uh, Facebook account setup. I know that this is a big concern for a lot of educators and a lot of um, uh, IT support department people. So um, Oscar is asking uh, how many um, Oculus headsets do you use if it's a fleet of more than six? And then he's also wants to find out a bit more if you have any special arrangement for using several Oculus for the same account or do you use different Facebook accounts? So probably he wants to know a bit more about how you set up your uh, currently those are the meta accounts how, how, how does it work for you if you have separate yeah. ones or the same for sure. all of them hmm. yeah yeah we have 10 we have 10 headsets we, we actually have nine and then i have my own personal device as a sort of testing device as well but when we we will have a large lab and um, we can have up to 10 headsets if needed it's probably the way we've run with it it may not be the most um sort of uh, efficient way is that we have 10 meta accounts. We had buy-in very early on from our, our IT um, support group here at Bond. So we actually formed uh, my colleagues uh, uh, immersive technology working group to allow us to bring in uh, this kind of technology as well as other things we have um, uh, portable butterfly ultrasound um, machines we use as well that we can link to iPads and so there was a lot of new technologies all coming in at the same time and obviously the IT people have security concerns they want to make sure that everything is on the same sort of network and that there are um, they have basically ownership of the, the, the devices and they can lock them down so they have uh, created essentially 10 separate bond accounts meta accounts uh, with individual passwords that only the staff have access to they're all linked to a separate iPad uh, on the same hidden uh, Wi-Fi network. And so that we tag one headset with a number and that correlates with the same number of iPads so that when you're rolling them out before the lab, you basically know which headset will cast to which uh, iPad because it's logged in with the same uh, account. The, um, 
the other way of, of, of doing it, I suppose, is um, you can have group accounts, I believe, but we've, we've not gone down that route. We just decided to have um, separate accounts that the students don't know about. They don't log in with their own Meta account, Facebook account. It's, uh, it's much less messy that way because we're running groups where the, the next group of students come in and they need to basically use those devices immediately. So we don't want to have any lag time of having to log in and log out. Um, the way we run it with the desktop computers is slightly different. We have a generic uh, bond account that the again the IT support team have set up and um, typically most institutions don't like generic accounts now because um, they want everyone to have a single sign on and their own specific login but they've been quite um, open to allowing us to to have the desktop computer set up that way so that all the students have the same login irrespective of which course they're in and which year group they're in and that allows them access to those uh, 12 computers for the for the desktop VR. Yeah. Amazing, Alan. Thank you for for uh, for answering Oscar's question. So uh, I also want to just sum up that basically uh, this is a requirement from uh, from Meta, not necessarily from uh, from our uh, application, from our solutions. So Meta does require to have a separate individual account per device, so that you can run the app on that particular device. So actually, you can't run the application on several devices under the same Meta, Meta account simultaneously. So this is one thing, and another thing is that it's quite safe for um, uh, for the users, I mean, for the institution that the uh, um, students, they won't be able to access, let's say, 3D organ on under the individual meta account, even if they switch between accounts, because then the license won't work. It's linked to a particular uh, device and the particular account. So there wouldn't be a, a, any problem. But as you said, those devices are under control and locked. So um, yeah. there are many options how you can work with that. Also, you can put the devices in the kiosk mode. So those are more technical things, but we are happy to answer those. You can and contact us as well uh, at prosupport at 3dorganon.com or through our website and we'll be happy to answer those more uh, technical uh, questions directly. Uh, perfect. So we have a few more questions coming in. Yep. Um, uh, Deepika is asking, is there any research conducted in your institution to validate uh, the work? Uh, to, validate, yeah, so, to validate that it works, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had quite a few. Again, the majority of the things that I am interested in research is the technology enhanced learning and so yes we've we've um, compared virtual reality and augmented reality i've all the way back to the very beginnings prior to any of these applications being on board i did a, a very early pilot study with an ipad where we created a custom in-house ebook we called it an interactive ebook in those days but it had a um, 3d anatomy models in there and some digital imaging and some extra um uh, content and we essentially tested that with a kind of cross um, study on traditional methods and all of this research is essentially coming out to say that it's as good as um, an augments traditional it, I don't think anything and I'm never proponent to say it's better than anything I think it has its use cases and it has an advantage in specific circumstances but I think over overwhelmingly what shows is if you implement it in addition to your current methods, whether that's, I know not everyone has access to um, cross-sections of cadavers, but just with models or videos or however you're using it currently, um, adding in this new technology enhances and augments the experience. Uh, I do think the one thing that the, the technology in the VR has shown to be is more engaging, but we know that when students are engaged, they're more motivated to learn and, and things come back to them and that enhances the learning experience. And so I think uh, this, you've got to cater for your different learners and, and we, everyone's different. And so some students take to this really, really well and, and we get the oohs and ahs initially, uh, but they continue to, to see the advantages of it and they continue to use it. Uh, some people still gravitate towards the, the, the pro sections. Uh, so you, you've got different learners, different learners le learn in different ways and different styles. I think this really helps those that struggle with visual learning. I think the advantage of the 3D um, organon is the those that are maybe coming from a background where they can't paint that picture in their mind's eye or they can't think about 3D anatomy relationships. It's, it's so much easier when you can zoom and pan and rotate around and then virtually strip things away to give them an idea of thinking about it in that three-dimensional sense when they then go on to look at medical imaging or they're then going on to, to, to the operating room, for instance. So, um, yeah, we, we, I think it just augments the technology, the, the research, sorry, is, is really showing that um, they, uh, they enhance and, and augment and engage more. Uh, and are just as good as, yeah. 
Very interesting, Alan. Thank you. And the last, the last question to finalize the um, uh, the webinar is uh, about the quizzes. So Shazia is again asking, how about assessments using virtual reality? If you use any quizzes, so you already mentioned a bit from this, but if you can maybe specify a bit more. Yeah, so that's all formative. Um, so it's mm -hmm. so basically it's a, a students not having any pressure or stress. There's no exam. Uh, questions marked or collected by the faculty staff they essentially mark themselves or test themselves and check how they're it's really a kind of a, a, a roadmap to basically gauge their learning journey and how where they're at and um, we haven't in a, embedded it in our actual summative assessments and um, we've moved to a, a digital uh, platform for all our medical assessments now and uh, that was sort of partly born out of covid but partly the way we were moving anyway with um, the, the way it gives analytics so the platform that we're currently using doesn't allow um, us to embed virtual reality models just yet I have asked for that functionality and um, they only really allow for videos or static images so the way we're testing our anatomy is maybe not as as um, high fidelity as, as we'd like to um, going back to the old traditional sort of spotter type um, lab based exams but it is something that the team uh, for the software vendor have said they're working on and so in the future I'm hoping that we can actually embed a, a virtual reality um, model in our questions that the students can interact with and that we can maybe pin their flag or or ask them questions in that but the built-in uh, formative quiz in in Organon uh, our learners really love when they find it it's 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 challenging because it's not just um knowing the answer from the the distractors but you've actually got to navigate on the field of view and actually find that structure so actually it's a really nice way of testing the students to see if they've actually grasped the the basic information and as I said in the in the webinar, it's kind of scaffolded that it spirals up from the very sort of low level, um, slightly easier questions to much, much more clinically advanced sort of more specialized questions. Yeah. So as, I suppose it can take you kind of through their journey of basic anatomy all the way through to the more clinical applied when you're in the, the end stages of your degree. Nice. We'll have one last one because it's a really nice question, um, uh, and that's uh, which 3D organon function or tool do you use? Do you use more or do you use the most? Uh, well, I'll give you two different two answers. The one I use the most is probably that draw functionality, but the one I think I've got the most uh, excitement about is the slice functionality, and I'm probably not using that enough. But I think mm -hmm. just playing about with that already with the the, the, the PC Power VR, um, as because we also as well as the clinical application, we also try and put some medical imaging into our labs as well. That's that's mm -hmm. so um, powerful for linking it to the to the imaging when they're looking at um, axial slices and CT scans or MRIs and kind of linking the two together. So I'm probably going to, if you ask me that question in another 12 months, I'll probably give you a different answer that slice functionality is the one that I kind of, I, will, I hope to use the most in the future. Okay, now nice. yeah, the, the slicing or the sectioning tool, the real-time section, sectioning tool is amazing yeah. and we invite all the people who are using the app to try it and to use it often. You can get beautiful cross-sections under different angles, so that's really helpful. We do agree with that and also the other tools we have in the app as the drawing tool you mentioned, that's very, very uh, useful as well for instructional purposes mostly. So we have some raised hands. If somebody wants to turn on the, turn on the uh, microphone and say something or write a message, uh, we we have a one, two minutes left. So um, yeah, we have a few raised hands. There was a uh, Yota joining. Yota, would you like to add something? Okay, I have a, yeah, I have one question from, from Yota as well. Um, do you run multi-user sessions? So it's maybe something that Joanna uh, was asking as well for the, uh, for the students being in the same virtual room. So are you doing that, the multi-user sessions? Or Outside something of, you... yeah, no, not, not, not typically because we're, we're running it all sort of um, as a one big lab embedded in the lab. So during COVID, mm -hmm. yes, uh, when we were mm -hmm. a bit more remote learning. So again, something that we've, we've, be, we've been in the sort of periphery of and I think there's even been some research coming out this week that I think the traditional sort of forum or lecture is really no longer valuable for, for our learners and that that kind of idea of running a sort of a, a virtual session where students get their own individual viewpoint and we can really interact much more um, 
in a much more interactive way, a much more powerful way with sort of active learning. Uh, it'll probably be the way that we move to in the future. We're not currently currently using it outside of the, the remote learning teaching. Yeah, that's something to to really to explore these multi-user, the 3D organon metaverse that you can use physically yeah. in the classroom as well and have your students in the same virtual space and interact with the models together with the educator. You can assess the students in the same VR space being in the same classroom or doing it, as you said, remotely. Uh, so there are a lot of use cases. And uh, if you use 3D organon or you want to try 3D organon, make sure you explore the 3D organon metaverse, which is something that it's uh, uh, getting very popular among uh, educators and uh, health professionals where you can actually not have only the individual experience but shared experience with the others being with you in the same space uh, as avatars uh, and uh, yeah, it's very very uh, um, useful tool to use uh, especially in this uh, new VR era so we invite you to, to explore that as well. Um, so thank you very much, Alan. Uh, this is, it was a really, really nice session, a very, very busy session, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, things that you mentioned for, for the attendees. So we are very grateful that we uh, had you today uh, at the webinar. And we all would also like to mention that uh, we are organizing webinars every month. So then please uh, keep an eye on our invitation for the next one in May. And, and uh, again, thank you, uh, Alan. Um, we want to say a few last words to conclude please uh, go ahead oh yeah well thank you for having me um, once more but i think probably i didn't uh, i was a bit remiss i didn't give my contact details at the time i'm more than happy for people to also contact me if they've got any questions of uh, how we how we implement it or anything that we, we we run out of time for questions or if something comes to them after hours or anyone that's watching this maybe on the on the recording as well uh, that didn't have a chance to, to join live i'm more than happy for you to, to send me an email as well and um, if you search for me at, at bond university and um, or if there's a way for you linking it in the in the the youtube metadata i'm more than happy for people to to, to reach out as well so uh, no thank you all for joining Amazing. us Thank you as well. The session will be uh, was recorded, will be shared with you. So as Alan said, feel free to get in touch with him and get in touch with us as well for any further information. Thank you very much again and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you.